There are a, a number of, uh, of things. Point one, one has to do with coverage. Who, who is covered and who isn't covered by the, uh, the regime? And you're, I assume you, you're somewhat familiar with the act. So, so who, who does this apply to? And uh, we, it's currently not applicable to governor and council appointees, except in so far as they are the heads of an organization. So somebody who is in charge of an agency, who is a GIC, is governed by the act. But all the other GICs are not. And uh, we've had several instances of uh, GICs who were the subject of disclosures, but that we could not really investigate because they are not governed by the act. So a parole board member, to pick an example of Fabiger with, because I used to be the chairperson of the parole board, we have 90 parole board members. The chairperson is subject to the act, but the parole board members are not. Uh, the same thing at the Immigration Refugee Board, where you have 100 people who are GICs. The chair is, is accountable, but not, not the other GICs. I, so I, will, I would propose that we, the government has a close look at that, because they are senior positions, well-paid positions in which you appoint people with, of whom you have great expectations. Uh, they're supposed to be the most responsible people that you select and select for, for them. So I think they should be covered by that. Another one is about the uh, Section 34 in the Act, which essentially tells me the minute I need to obtain information outside of the public sector, I have to stop that portion of my investigation. So if we investigate something, and suddenly I need to get your visa record, for instance, your visa card records. I, I have to stop that. I cannot ask Visa to provide me with your, your accounts. I cannot uh, cross the line and talk to, uh, to an entity which is not part of the public sector. Even though in the public sector of the province, a municipality, anything that's not federal public sector, I cannot uh, investigate on, essentially. So that's another example. Second category would be better protection for the people who are the, who believe they've been the victims of reprisals, and one one such protection would, would have to do with uh, what what I call the uh, the possibility for the tribunal when we refer a case to the tribunal. And we've referred six such cases up until now. Uh, <coughs> we would like the tribunal to be in a position to grant interim relief to the, to the person, somebody who's lost their job who complained of reprisal. We did an investigation, we conclude that there were reasonable grounds to believe that they were fired because they made a disclosure. I applied to the tribunal. Uh, this whole transaction can easily take up to two years. And I would like the tribunal to be able to order, if the complainant so wishes, to order some, some form of relief in the meantime. Because two years is a, I think it's a reasonable minimum to expect. It could be more than two years as well. And I think it's very difficult for people who will be very reluctant to make disclosures if they know that they could be dragged before a tribunal for a few years to come. So that's one example. Uh, I'll just consult my notes here. Uh, if I'm here when the review starts, that's a big if. I don't know whether I'll whether the review will start before I leave, before I leave at the end of this year. Uh, there's the burden of proof issue. Who, who has the burden of proving uh, that they were the victim of reprisals? So I'm currently toying with the idea and discussing internally whether we should propose to the parliamentary committee or whomever does the review uh, to shift that burden so that if we investigate, if we believe you lost your job because you made a disclosure, then it would be up to the employer to prove that it was not the reprisal, to shift the burden. Uh, because employers are obviously all the time, if not all the time, the vast majority of situations, they're much better equipped financially uh, to, to handle such a difficult task as proving why something has happened and has not happened, uh, rather than ask the former public servant who has lost their job to uh, equip themselves with good legal representation to prove that actually they were fired because of this fusion. That's a, that's a big one, to, uh, to increase significantly the degree of protection in reality of those who were uh, the victims of uh, reprisals.
And those are, I think, the, the big ones, and we have smaller ones such as uh, we, have a, we have a problem which has never materialized, thank God, and there are three months left, so I, I will touch wood. Uh, the Act only allows me and the Deputy Commissioner to make the key decisions that have to be made in the file. So what happens with the day that both the Deputy Commissioner, Joe Friday, and I are conflicted in the case? The Act is completely silent. If, we're, uh, if you're, uh, let's say, our complainant, and both Joe and I have professional and personal relations with you, then who handles the case? The Act is silent, so we're proposing, we will be proposing that uh, the government appoint an ad hoc commissioner if and when, should the day ever come that this happens. Mm -hmm. Somebody would be on a retainer to act as the commissioner if such a thing happens. Mm -hmm. uh, because the public sector, albeit large, is still, the world is a small place, nevertheless, in spite of that. And Joe and I have both worked at the Department of Justice, and we've been lucky that there hasn't been a single situation where we were both in a conflict situation. 